book of Revelation, chapter 1, and we're just about finished with that chapter. Um, we're going to pick it up at verse 16. And remember that chapter 1 of the book of Revelation is Jesus from all different kinds of perspectives. Right? His voice is like the sound of many waters. He walks among the candlesticks. You want to put a little mental marker next to each one of those things. Because as we go through the seven letters to the seven churches, you're going to see that those perspectives of Jesus are going to come out in each one of the letters. Because it's in those perspectives that He helps us to understand how He feels about each particular church. And what their future is going to be if they don't turn, if they don't repent. You know, a lot of people talk about how merciful God is and how He's so filled with grace. It's true. But as you read the, the Bible, you can't deny that there is a line that He draws in the sand. And when you cross that line, thank God it's rare, but when you cross that line, you have exhausted His grace and His mercy. And the Bible calls those people uh, reprobate-minded people. Their minds have been given over to Satan. They're not going to come back. And you think about people like Jeffrey Dahmer who was kidnapping all those boys and eating their bodies, Charles Manson, and all these different people. You say, what on earth is wrong with them? Well, what's wrong with them is they've lost their soul. And there's no more conviction. So they do the most evil, most heinous uh, things. And uh, so we want to put a little mental note there next to each one of the descriptions of, uh, of Jesus. And uh, let's go ahead and finish it up. So Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 16. Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 16. And it says, He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. We talked about that last week. And his countenance, his face, was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, John said, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive evermore. Amen. Let me just stop there for a second. Do any of you guys know of anybody who's ever said, that they've seen God or that they've been to heaven and then they write a book or they make a TV program? I mean, I've never known them, but I've heard of them. You've heard of them? Yeah. So that's interesting to me. I always trip on those people because Paul was taken to heaven. They beat him so bad with rocks. They stoned him to death, actually. And so his soul went to heaven and he saw everything that was there. And he said that it was so beautiful that words could not express it that it would be a crime to make an attempt at mentioning what was there. John sees Jesus and he falls to his face as though he's dead. Same thing happened to Daniel. So when these people talk about going to heaven and then they write books that sell thousands and thousands of books, I have my doubts about those people. That's just my opinion. And so um, he says that I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Why does he say that? Because he wants people to know that since he died and came alive forever, there is a hope that we also will do the same. He says, I have the keys of Hades, that is hell and of death. Well, if he has the keys and you're in relationship with him, you don't ever have to worry about going to hell. To die is gain, the Bible says. And then he tells John, Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. That is the outline for the entire book. You're going to have more clarity on that tonight. It, when we get into it, you'll see. Um, then he says, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. How many of you guys know what an angel is? Do you know what the word angel means? It means messenger. Messenger. Right? He says, so the seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches. So they would be the pastors of those churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. 
Very important to understand that as we get into uh, to chapter 2. So why do you think, and you always, if you want to form a good opinion, to get a good idea, you always got to go back to Scripture. But why do you think that Jesus refers to the pastors or the messengers, and messenger could be anybody, doesn't have to be a pastor, as stars? What do you think about that? He could have said to the seven pastors of the church. Right? He said he could have said to the seven messengers of the church. But he calls them angels or, or, or messengers, I should say. I think the answer is found in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Because when you speak of God to people, you're a messenger, aren't you? And any one of us could be a messenger. That group of people walking up and down G Street as I drove here, they're messengers. Right? In Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Those who turn many to righteousness are like the stars forever and ever. So when we become messengers of the Word of God, people's lives begin to change. Might be a little bit, might be a lot, might be a little bit now, but then later on, those people get saved, their whole lives are transformed. I remember when I was about 17 years old, I was hooked on heroin, I had a, a, a girlfriend who became the mother of my oldest son later on. But she took me to a Victory Outreach concert. And I didn't really care for all the screaming and the yelling and all that. But something was said there about God. I didn't like it. I didn't think I was paying attention. But look what has happened almost 30 years later. So when you speak about God, don't underestimate the power of the words that come from your mouth. And when those lives change, someday you're going to go to heaven. I don't know what it's going to look like. But you are going to be like shining stars forever and ever. You will stand out above the rest of the people that are there, is what it's saying. Okay? It also says in verse 16 that those stars are where? In His right hand. Meaning what? Yeah. If you're a messenger, you are under God's special protection. Nobody can harm you unless He gives them permission. And I have heard story after story after story about people who are witnesses for God. They get in dangerous circumstances and their lives are spared. How many of you guys went with us on Monday to Hardcore? Okay. You know that guy that was up there, Bobby Mikado? My brother was Bobby Mikado's connection in the early 70s, right? Bobby was a, a heroin addict for many years, did a lot of time, the whole thing. When Bobby got saved and he started going into the prisons to preach the word, he's a chaplain, right? At one point, there was a guy in the county jail that was a real mobster. I didn't know him personally, but I knew of him growing up. And when Bobby went in there, they said, hey, Bobby, I won't mention his name. This guy wants to talk to you. Follow me. And they escorted Bobby to the showers. And this guy was waiting for him. And this guy knew Bobby. They grew up a couple of towns away from each other. And he said, hey, Bobby, I need you to do me a favor. Bobby said, I gave my whole life to Christ. I'm not about doing anybody any favors in here. And he said, you effing B-I-T-C-H. He said, I should take your life right now. And Bobby just stayed quiet. He said he was waiting for a sharp broomstick to go into his back. And then after they waited there for about 30 seconds, Bobby turned around and walked out of the showers. This guy that told him that, I know who he is. He has killed many people. He, in fact, he just got out of prison. He was in prison over 40 years for a contract murder. He killed a doctor, this guy. But he killed many people and killed more people when he was in prison. This guy had no problem killing Bobby. But he didn't do it because Bobby was a messenger and God had him under special protection. That's the guy that you saw on Monday. Sometimes he shares it. Wednesdays you'll hear him share that story. And then, of course, verse 19 is the outline for the entire book of Revelation. So pass these out. Greg. As he's passing that out, I'm going to read it again. Verse 19, here we go. This is Jesus telling John, what? 
to write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. If you understand that verse, you will find it much easier to understand the entire book. So when you get home later on or whatever, this is what I want you to do. You see where the first little castle, it's a church, is right there? Draw a line. Look, from there to there is Revelation chapter 1 to 3. Okay, those are the things that John saw and the things which are. What is that? It's 2,000 years of church history, which we are coming to an end of. All right? And then from there to the other side, where it says the book of Revelation, right on top, Revelation chapter 6 through 19. I'm going to have this here for you guys afterwards, so you can write it afterwards. And what is Revelation chapter 6 through 19? The seven years of tribulation, all laid out right there in the middle. And then at the end, where you see the other little church there, on that side you write Revelation chapter 20 to 22. And what is that? That is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is the judgment for all the people who were not in relationship with Jesus Christ. They're sent to hell. Others are sent to heaven. And then, of course, the new heaven and the new earth. So if you keep this and look at it every once in a while, it's going to help you to understand... Not only the book of Revelation, but the entire uh, Bible. Okay? So I'm going to leave this here. You guys can look at it after and then... Do you know about when Jesus is about to return? Can be after this lifetime? How long? As we go through the study of these seven letters, you're going to get a much better idea. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. All right. No, it's not. So now, chapters 2 and 3, the seven letters to seven churches. Now that should get your attention if you know the Bible <laughs> because there were a lot more than seven churches at this time. There was the church in Jerusalem, Acts 11, chapter 22. There was the church in Rome, uh, the book of Romans, chapter 16, verse 5. There was the church at Antioch where we were first called Christians. That's Acts chapter 11, verse 26. The book of Colossians is actually a letter. Who's it written to? The church in Colossae. The book of Thessalonians, who's that written to? The church of Thessalonica. The book of Philippians, who's that written to? The church of Philippi. So there were all these churches, but these letters are not to those churches. It's just to seven churches. So you got to ask yourself at that point, why does Jesus mention only seven churches? And you got to get this. You got to get this. It's for three reasons. Number one, because of the spiritual condition of those seven churches. Right? These letters are going to explain that to us. They're going to illustrate the spiritual condition of those seven churches. And it's going to tell us the spiritual condition of all the churches over the last 2,000 years, listen, in all of its phases. And because the church is 2,000 years old and we have history books, we can look back and say, wow, if these letters were in any other order, we wouldn't be able to say that. But because they are in the order that they're in, we could see church history told in advance. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. Let me give you an example. If I told you today, or a stranger came up to you and said, Hey, don't you live at Hope Room and Board, don't you? You say, Yeah, yeah. You know, God spoke to me. You know what he said? He said that Hope Room and Board is going to really grow in 2020 and 2021. They're going to get an apartment building. It's going to grow. Things are going to be happening at Hope Room and Board. But in 2022, it's going to struggle. And they're only going to have two houses left. But then, in 2030, they're going to have 20 houses. And it's going to be a church. They're going to have a church on one of the properties. But then Mario's going to die and then somebody's going to take over. But then, and then on and on and on. That would be prophetic, right? That's what we see with the churches. Jesus is telling us what is going to become of each church's spiritual condition over the period of 2,000 years, and He's telling us before it happens. So you're going to see that as we go through it, and it's going to blow your mind 
because we're going to talk about the church as it as it exists today and its corruption how it's been an, an, becoming an entertainment center and lots of showboating it's like a circus sometimes you think jesus didn't know that was going to happen oh no he knew it was going to happen we're going to read about it when we get to the last church the church of laodicea well if that's the last church and that's the way the church is now guess what jesus is pretty close to returning because it's the last church right so we're not there yet we're in the letter to the church of uh of ephesus and it's interesting because each one of these letters is like a report card on each church it's like a report card and what's interesting is the churches that thought they were doing bad jesus actually thought they were doing pretty good the ones that thought they were doing great jesus says oh no you got big problems <laughs> right and so um we say to ourselves well why why is that why is that well i think it's told to us again the best commentary on the bible is the commentary is is the bible right in isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 and 9 god says my thoughts are not your thoughts your ways are not my ways says the lord as far as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts than your thoughts so when you judge yourself don't come at it from your own thoughts or your own ideas come at it from the bible's perspective and as you do always remember jesus loves you his candlestick is in your midst you are one of the ones in his hand yeah but i'm so far away from what the bible says okay so if you're like me maybe you're going to get so far away that he scolds you but what parent is more loving the one who lets you do whatever you want or the one that scolds you the one that scolds you he loves you right and so we always want to keep that uh in mind um so it's not that god somehow plays games it's the way he thinks and the way he operates that is so contrary to ourselves you know the more you get to know god the more you're going to realize how different you are from him but at the same time you're going to begin to see that you're going to become more and more like him you know why because you are going to become like the people you hang around with did you know that when i took my first fix after three or four months later i went in the kitchen my mom's house my mom and dad were not divorced yet and my dad seemed to be there waiting my dad let me do whatever i wanted to do but not this and he said hey i want to talk to you my dad's kind of a big guy and i said talk to me about what a skinny little teenager you know i want to talk to you about what the hell you're doing he said and i said what the hell am i doing and he said excuse my language you're using that shit he told me and i said how do you know i'm using that shit you know what he said because I know who you're hanging around with. I had no more words to argue the accusations. If you tell me who you're hanging around with, I'm going to tell you what you're doing. That's just the way. That's human nature. Right? So, that works in a positive sense too. If you're spending time in the Word and prayer and devotions with the Lord, I already know you're becoming more and more like Him. Right? Human nature. All right. Um... So, the, the second thing about, uh, about uh, the other thing, the second thing I should say about these letters is that they describe or explain the spiritual condition of every church today. Because the spiritual condition of these seven churches are the same spiritual condition of every single church today you mean the jewish synagogue mario oh we're going to see it in here you mean the catholic church mario we're going to see it in here you mean the four square church and calvary chapel and victory outreach we're going to see them in here okay four square church you ever heard of that denomination yeah they're big they're big they've only been around about a hundred years but they're all over the world now 
But we're going to see them through a magnifying glass as we study these uh, seven churches right here. And so just to give you like a brief outline, this first church, the church of Ephesus, it describes the spiritual condition of the church from 33 AD when Jesus was crucified to 100 years later. Okay, uh, The second church, the church of Smyrna, is the suffering church. It's going to be the spiritual condition of the church from 100 AD to 300 AD. The church suffered tremendously. You know how we talked a few weeks ago about uh, Caesar Nero hanging Christians on crosses and burning them like candles? That was during the time of the church of Smyrna. Does anybody know the big shift that took place in church history in 300 AD? Didn't they make it like corporate? No, not yet. That's the next church. What happened in 300 AD... After all the torture of Christians, a guy named Constantine became the emperor of Rome, the Caesar of Rome. And when he went to battle, he says that he saw the clouds in the shape of a cross and he heard the words, conquer in this name. Anybody ever watch the Pope when he's on television? He's got what looks like, it looks like a P and then it's a cross. That's because that's what uh, Constantine claimed to have seen in the shape of clouds. So when he saw that, he went into battle and he won. And he said from that point on that Christianity would be the religion of Rome. If you ever go to Israel, some of the sites that you're going to see and the events that took place there were discovered by Constantine's mother. He sent her there to scope out the land and make these discoveries. Pretty interesting. That lasted for a long, long time. But like anything else, it became corrupt. And it became what we know today as the Catholic Church. But not at first. So that's the Church of Smyrna. The did, church... Did the Church of Smyrna, were they the ones that... <coughs> were they not... Did God not ask for repentance because they were being... All of them. Uh, well, no. So Smyrna is one of two churches that gets no bad report card. Yeah. Only good things are said of it. Right, then you come to the Church of Pergamus, which was from 300 uh, A.D. to present days, still around with us, right? And Pergamus means perverted, and so Jesus is going to refer to them as the Church of the perverted marriage. Why is it perverted? Because it compromised with the world. And that's not what Jesus stands for. The church is the bride of Christ. And just like any husband, he wants his bride to be pure. And this church was not pure. It's after Constantine and that whole thing turned into corruption, the church began to compromise. We'll get into that. And then there's the church of uh, Thyatira. That is the church from 300 AD to about 1400 when it started to fall apart. But it's still here today and it's the Catholic church. Church of Thyatira. It's the church of continued suffering. You say, well, why is the Catholic Church, why would it be referred to as the Church of Continued Suffering? Well, how many of you guys know that Catholics, one day a year, set aside a time, not all the churches, but many of them, where they walk to the church on their knees? And the one who has the bloodiest knees is the one who pleased God the most. How many of you guys know that a Catholic Church has Jesus hanging from the cross? Yeah. He's yeah. suffering continually. Does a Christian church have Jesus hanging on the cross? No, never. Never. Right? How many of you guys know that when you go to confession at a Catholic church, they say, say, 15 Hail Marys, 18 Our Fathers, and 5 Acts of Contrition. Why? Because you got to be punished for your sins. Well, no, you don't. That's not what Jesus said. And how many of you know that the Catholic church believes in purgatory? Yeah, when you die, you don't go to heaven. You got to be punished for your sins. Well, if I got to be punished for my sins, then Jesus died for nothing. So some people refer to the Catholic Church as the church of continual suffering. Wrong. That's not what the Bible teaches. And then there's the church of Sardis. And if you think the Catholic Church was bad, the church of Sardis gets even a worse report card. Anybody know what the church of Sardis uh, represents? The denominational churches. Calvary Chapel, Foursquare, Assemblies of God, uh, Victory Outreach, denominational churches. You know, most 
Many scholars believe that the day is coming very soon when the church is going to be meeting in the house again. Because churches are just falling apart. I think I mentioned it before. But right now there are 3,500 churches in America closing their doors every single year for about the last five to seven years. That's never happened in American history before. If the church returns to the house like this, this church. I've never felt more like a pastor since we've been doing this, to tell you the truth. But they say that when the church returns to the house, who's going to be the church's worst enemy? Not the government. Yeah. Not the church of Satan. The denominational churches. They're not going to like it because you're not there to pay the bills. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So the Church of Sardis is going to be an interesting church because it really talks about us. We'll see when we get there. And then there's the Church of Philadelphia, which is the enduring church. It happens to be, remember, God doesn't think the way we do. It happens to be God's favorite church. But not really man's favorite church because it's not a mega church. It doesn't even have a worship team. It's very small, Jesus said. It has little power, but, Jesus says, they have held on to my word and they have not denied my name. Many churches today stay away from the Bible. They'll give you a verse or two and that's it. Why? Because people won't sit around for that. They're not going to come to church for that. They're not going to give money to that church. They want entertainment, baby. <laughs> You know, in Hollywood, there's a church called Mosaic. And I know one of the founders of that church. And uh, on Instagram, I think it was, Camille found it. Last Sunday, they had a ballerina. And I don't know what you call the dude. What do you call a guy ballerina? Whatever he is. <laughs> Mr. Ballerina. Mr. Ballerina. And they were both dancing on stage for about a half an hour. <laughs> Excuse me, that's church? No, that's a circus. But it's Hollywood and all the artsy people are going to pay big money to go see that. WWF Church. Yeah, okay. I never heard of that. But well, right. It's because it's WWF Entertainment, not wrestling. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, don't tell Raymond that. <laughs> no, he knows that. No, Raymond. Raymond wrestling's real, right, Raymond? <laughs> but you understand where the church is going, right? Nobody wants to go to church no more, so we're going to entertain them. Jesus says, no, we never compromise like that. The church is for the Bible, and the Bible is for the church, period. Well, what if the church don't grow? That's none of your business. In fact, when you go through the Bible, people who are saved are always a remnant. They're just a few. They say that there were billions of people on the earth in Noah's day. How many people were saved from the flood? Eight. Eight. God's true people are always just a remnant, never the majority. Uh, and then the last church is the church of Laodicea. That's the compromising, or e they call it the emerging church of today. Emerging, why emerging? Because it's emerging with the world. Some of those churches you go to, you say, man, I can't see that this church is any different from the VFW or the YMCA. It's all the same. Yeah, because they're not doing anything with the Bible, right? So, the yep, the YMCA. So, as we go through the seven letters, you're going to wake up to a lot of things. And, you guys, let me tell you something. When I started to understand the Bible, I was one of the most bitter, hostile, angriest persons you've ever met in your life. Because as I got this information, I realized that the church had been deceiving me and many people for a long time. And now I have all the ammunition in the world to step on them suckers. And I did it in Narcotics Anonymous too. I would go to meetings, I would let them suckers have it. They didn't want me to share. <laughs> Seriously. But after some years, I let go, I vented all that anger. And Jesus spoke to me, not in words, but just in my heart. And he said, Mario, how many people are saved now? And I said, none. He said, that's right. You got to love them before you can preach to them. Right? Not bitterness. Not bitterness. And then the last reason, or what we see in the church, number three, 
is that each of these churches are going to describe our own personal spiritual uh, um, what do you call it? condition all right and that's why each one of them says he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit is saying if you have an ear these letters are speaking to you okay so revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 7 the church of ephesus here we go jesus said to john to the angel of the church of ephesus write these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand who is that jesus right Who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus walking in the midst of the church. So remember, Jesus has you in his right hand, but he also has you in his midst. He's protecting you, but at the same time, he's hanging around with you. Right? Here's what he says to the church of Ephesus. I know your works, your labor, your patience. And that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And have found them to be liars, Jesus says. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake. And have not become weary. Okay, good so far, right? Here comes verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You can underline that in the Bible because that's what this letter is going to key right into. He says, Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. What happens if he removes the lampstand? He removes himself. Right? You'll be having church without me, Jesus says. You know what's interesting about the last church? It said, Jesus tells them, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you let me in, I will sup with you and you with me. We'll have fellowship. You know what's interesting about that? Jesus is outside the church. He's supposed to be inside. He left the church. You know what else is interesting? They kept having church. There are some churches today having church minus Jesus. It's an amazing thing. He says, but this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus doesn't hate the Nicolaitans. I'll tell you who they are in a minute. He doesn't hate them. He hates their deeds. Very, very rarely will you find Jesus saying, I hate an individual. Right? <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. And then verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So the name of each church will tell us how Jesus feels about the church. The church of Ephesus, the word Ephesus means darling or desired one. It is the wife of Jesus and he loves her very much. This church is precious to Jesus Christ. Okay, So let me give you a little bit of a background on the city of Ephesus. Because that's going to help us to understand the church. There's a church here in San Bernardino that you guys were going to over here. What was the name the of it? Way. The Way. The Way. Now, if I was living in China and somebody wrote to me about the church called The Way in the city of San Bernardino... And I knew about the city of San Bernardino. I could get a pretty good idea of what kind of church that is. It's not Mosaic. Mosaic's in Hollywood. Mosaic wouldn't be in San Bernardino. But that church, the way, is in San Bernardino. Well, I know right away. They're feeding the, home, the hungry. They're housing the homeless. They're evangelizing in the streets. Why? Because you need to do that in San Bernardino. You won't get anywhere doing that in Hollywood. Right? So, the name of the church tells us how Jesus feels about the church but the city it's in tells us a little bit about the church as well right so in that city in the city of Ephesus which was a beautiful city there was the temple of Diane Diane was a goddess 
who evolved from Simiramis in the book of Genesis, who was the wife of Nimrod. So Satan doesn't have any new tricks, but he knows how to repackage. And so Diana is just repackaged. So she is the god of multi-breasts. She's a very grotesque god. She is the goddess of fertility. Hey, you got married. Your wife can't have babies. Go to the temple, Diane. Pray. Give your money. And your wife will have babies. Right? Her temple that they had built on the hill, which is called Mars Hill. You guys ever heard of Mars Hill? Acts chapter 17. It was a real place. The temple was built on top there. The ruins are still there if you go there today. And it was a big beautiful temple it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world because it was 340 feet by 165 feet okay that means you see these lots going down the street all these houses if you take nine of them okay that would be how wide the temple was now go back i don't know five blocks that's how long the temple was. It was huge. Today we build buildings like that. Back in those days, that was a, an engineering yes. mystery. Are they still exactly. around? What's that? Uh, the, the temples? The ruins. The, this ruins? Te the ruins yeah. of this temple are still there. Wow. It had 120 Roman columns that were 60 feet high. The place was huge. Inside of that temple lived the priest. And listen... 1,000 male and female temple prostitutes. The prostitutes raised money to support the building and pay the priests. So you would go in there and go get with a prostitute if you wanted to. Or on the weekends, all the prostitutes would come down the hill and get with the men. Well, what were the male prostitutes doing? Same thing. Wow. It was a very... Whenever we talk about cults and false gods, we're always talking about the most heinous, the sickest things your minds can imagine. Okay? Um, they also, if you read the book of Acts, they used to make little statues and big statues of the goddess Diane, and they would sell them. Kind of like <laughs> the Catholic Church. Yeah, kind of like that. And this is another way that the craftsmen and the priests would raise money. Right? It also housed, this temple, inside the temple, was the first bank the world had ever seen. So the whole banking system came from this temple. We wouldn't have banks today if they didn't do that here. Pretty, pretty amazing, right? Um, in Acts chapter 19, you read that Paul went to Ephesus and he preached and a riot uh, broke out there. And thousands of people got saved. Acts chapter 19, you can read all about it. Um, when that happened, there was a guy named Demetrius who was one of the craftsmen of these little idols. He went to the, um, not the stadium, but the, uh, not the arena, but the, uh, the Colosseum, well, not the Colosseum, what do you call it? The theater of Ephesus. Check it out. It had 24,000 seats. And there, he pulled everybody there and he started to talk bad about Paul and about Jesus. And he said, look what these fools are doing to our city and our economy. There's thousands of people becoming Christians. They won't get with the prostitutes anymore. And they won't buy these little idols. We're going broke. And he got them all stirred up and a riot broke out. They used to say, scholars say, that wherever Paul preached, there was either revival or riot. <laughs> but he never left the place the same again when he did leave. Yeah. Um, it also housed the third largest library of the ancient world. Okay. Uh, it fell apart during an earthquake and in 1978. They reconstructed the face of it. If you go there, you can see it. Or you can Google. You'll see pictures of it. But this library held 12,000 books. You say, well, that's not a lot. They were made out of papyrus. Each one was handwritten. <laughs> That's a lot of books for the time, right? Anybody know what papyrus is? Yeah, but what's it made out of? It's made out of the reeds. You know those reeds that grow in the rivers? They call them cattails sometimes. So they would get those and they would put them, I think, in hot water and they would step on them and kind of put them together in a mesh and they would write on those things. 
So 12,000 books made of that stuff, man. That, that was some uh, uh, library that was there. In front of the library was the main street that was paved with marble. Ephesus was a super wealthy city. Why was it wealthy? It well, that, yep, that was one reason. But there was another reason. It had a big harbor like San Pedro and Long Beach. Fish? Harbor. <laughs> no, well, trade. Okay. Trade. Do you, have you guys ever thought, do you guys know that the state of California is the 20th largest economy in the world? Did you know that? In the world. California has more California money than from, from the rest of the United States, then the rest of the United States becomes the fifth largest in the world instead of the number one. So California is wealthier than most nations in the world. Anybody know why? Because we got prostitute people here. <laughs> G Street. The rich people here and stuff. No. no, the rich people came after. Let me tell you why. Central Valley. If you if you are getting a shipment of those clocks from China. I bet you it was made in China. But you're in Las Vegas, Nevada. Where do your clocks have to go before they get to Nevada? They got to come to San Pedro, Long Beach, San Diego, or San Francisco, baby, or you're not getting them. <laughs> so everything for Utah, Nevada, Arizona, Probably New Mexico, Utah. You got to deal with California. Well, and to make more money, they can come from the East Coast. Well, I think on the East Coast they, they go around they, the they, they go. They stand up on train. Yeah, but they go around the other way in ships. So from the east, if you look at a globe, you can come across the Pacific or go the backside Atlantic. But that's why go. they made the, the, uh, the canal. Yeah, man, that that could yeah. be. Yeah. The other thing is. The city of Ephesus had crossroads, right? One of the things that puts San Bernardino on a map is that it is right in between the 210 freeway, the 10 freeway, the 215, and very close to the 15 and very close to the 330. So if you want to go to any one of those surrounding cities, you got to come through San Bernardino, right? Ephesus had crossroads. If you wanted to go to some of those other major cities, you had to go through Ephesus, so it was a very large, it was very beautiful, it was a very wealthy city. And you know what I found out? It was one of the first cities in the world to have public toilets with running water. That's big. We're talking 2,000 years ago. When I went to Israel, I saw it. So you would have a wall like that, and then you would have what looks like a bench, but it had holes in it. No toilet seats, holes. It was made out of stone, right? And then they would get water from a river over there and it would run a little canal underneath each toilet going out like that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And so now the message to this church at uh, Ephesus. Well, verse 1 says that Jesus assures the church that they are in His hand and therefore in His protection. Right? Even though they're messing up, He's still with them. Merciful, gracious, hold Him His hand. Right? And he also says that he is dwelling among them because it says he walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So he says, hey, you're in my hand. I love you. I'm protecting you. And I am in your midst. When you guys meet on Sundays, I'm there, is what he says, right? <coughs> Verses 2 and 3, he gives his commandments. He commends the church for their good works. Is that the, where that came from? Whenever two or more get together... Not really. We'll see why in a minute. Because it doesn't always work that way with this church. But he commends them, he congratulates them for their good works, for their uncompromising commitment to truth. Churches and other people are so afraid to speak the truth today. How many here know the population of the homosexuals in the United States of America today? It's a lot. What percentage are they? Who said it's a lot? How many do you think there are? Of the population of California? No. In the world? The homosexual community in the United States. No. 40. But it's interesting that you say that. He says 40. It's interesting that you say that. Do you know that they're less than 3%? Oh, wow. No, that's not. That's less than what they can. Well, that's People are saying it. 
We are 350 million population in the United States. 3% is a big number, but it's a very small percentage. So why are department stores and people so afraid to speak the truth to say, no, 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 you were not born that way. That was your choice. Right. And what you're doing in the sexuality you're practicing is not natural. <laughs> oh, it's natural? Then let me see you make a baby. You can't make a baby because it's not natural. But oh, goodness, don't speak against them. And now the churches are the same way. And it's not that we hate homosexuals. We love all sinners. But please don't ask me to agree with your lie because you're asking me to violate my relationship with Jesus Christ. But they're afraid to do it. Yeah? My sister's gay. She's yeah. married to a woman. Yeah. Gay. And I don't hold it against her. I just tell her she's the foot behind closed doors. Well, and everybody gets to choose their lifestyle. That's right. But let me tell you something interesting about that. When you study the Bible, Greg, you're going to want to remember this. You have what they call the law of first mention. The law of first mention when you study the Bible. That is, every time you see something mentioned for the first time, it's going to be a pattern all throughout the Bible. Does anybody know when homosexuality is mentioned for the first time? No. It's in the book of Genesis. It was Sodom and Gomorrah. And there were gays living in Sodom. And two angels went to visit Lot, who was living in the city. Lot was Abraham's nephew. And when he went in, when the angels went into the city, Lot brought them in the house. Right? And when the homosexuals found out that the angels were in the house, they started banging on the door. They said, let us in or bring them out. We want to know them. We want to have sex with them. And Lot said, no, 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 no. These are my guests. I can't allow that. And they started banging and kicking in the door. That's interesting. You know why? Because gays were saying, Leave us alone. You're persecuting us. You're harassing us. And Christians said, No, 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 no. We don't want to harass you. We don't want to harm you. We don't hate you. We love you. You're, you can be forgiven just like anybody else. I always tell them when I get into debate, I'm a heroin addict. What I was doing was far worse than homosexuality. I'm not in any way saying I'm better than you. But you know what my problem is? You want to do today what you were doing in the book of Genesis. You don't want to just practice your, 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 your homosexuality. You want to bring it into my house. You want to teach my kids in public schools that what you're doing is natural. No thank you. Right. You want to have drag queens go to preschools to read books to the children. Do you know that they're doing that now? Yep. Social know, security my is my positive. Sister adopted a boy. Yeah. In her and her wife, it's raising them, like the family. So you understand that where truth is concerned, we speak it with love, but we never deny it. Yeah. Because to deny the truth is to deny Jesus Christ. And think about when he went to the cross. He didn't do it denying us. He did it out of love. Right? So we don't hate that community. We love them. We forgive them. God would forgive them if they would repent. Right? But at the same time, we say, wait a minute. I'm not going to believe your lie. So I have a thing from Social Security right here, Mario, that says, Social Security is processing some claims for same-sex couples. Sure. What made you take a picture of that? Because it's just ridiculous. So let's continue reading. Um, so they, they had an uncompromising commitment to truth. Jesus loved that. He says they had patience and they were consistent in all of these things. And then in verse 6, it's interesting. He says that they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans and Jesus hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans too. We're going to talk about what that is in, the, in a minute. So what were they doing? Their good works. Well, knowing the church, they were probably feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, caring for the widows and the orphans, probably having potluck fellowships, you know, a couple of Sundays out of the month or whatever. They were doing good works. Jesus says, very good. That's good. I'm glad that you're doing that. And then, of course, they didn't fail to confront lies or what the Bible calls heresy. 
And that is interesting because they heeded the warning of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 7 verses 15 through 19, before Jesus went to the cross, he said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree does not bear good fruit. It, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Jesus did not say that we judge people. We are not judges. We can't judge because we can't see the heart and we don't have enough information. Only God has that. But we are fruit inspectors. So you can tell me whatever you want, but I'm going to look at your life, right? I'm going to watch you. And if you're believing some kind of false gospel, it's going to come to the surface. I'm going to recognize it and I'm going to say, hey, you got no part here. Well, I want to teach a Bible study at Hope Room and Board. Well, you can't. Right? Because we're down with the truth, man. We've been believing a lie all our lives. You know, before I came to the Lord, to my, my crazy mind, it, it, whatever was a lie was the truth, and whatever was the truth was a lie is completely twisted. It takes a long time to retrain the mind. You know, I'm still doing it. So we don't need that here, right? But we don't judge people. Not homosexuals. Not false teachers. We don't judge them. But we judge their fruit. Why? Because we want to be on our guard. If I come by F Street next week and I see Kathleen talking to a lady with no makeup and a long dress and her husband is wearing a suit and they're carrying a rack of magazines, it's Jehovah's Witness. I'm going to say, Kathleen, get away from them. Right? Why? Because I love her. Camille and I, Hope Room and Board, is trying to change her mind. We don't want more lies being poured in. Right? But do we love Jehovah's Witness? Of course we do. Of course we do. Right? So the church of Ephesus was doing a good job at all of these things. The other, says that, the other thing Jesus said is that they're patient. In what? How many of you guys have ever shared with people that Jesus is going to come back? And you know what? The world thinks you're crazy for saying that. Come on, man. That, that can never happen. He's going to come in the clouds. Trumpet blast? Come on, man. That's not going to happen. You're not right in the mind saying stuff like that. They endured that. They got mocked too. But they said, that's okay. You can say what you want to say. We know our Jesus is not a liar. He said he's coming back. He's going to come back. Jesus says, good job. Right? Um, and then lastly, it says that they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans as Jesus also hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. What is a Nicolaitan? Break it up into two words. Nico and Laetan or Laos, L-A-O-S. Nico is the Greek word for Nike or Nike in English. How many of you guys own Nikes? Okay. Nico and Nike simply means to conquer or to lord over, to be the boss. That's what it means. Laos or Laotans means common people and so what you had in those days is false churches or cults that were ruling over the people i would tell serena how to dress to wear makeup or not wear makeup i would tell her who her husband's going to be i would tell her how much of her check she had to donate to the church that she had to come to the church and work whatever it was i'm dominating her is that jesus method of ministry no what was jesus method of ministry Remember what he did one day with all the disciples? He said, hey guys, come here, I want to talk to you. He said, bring me a towel and bring me a bowl of water. And what did he do? He washed their feet. He washed their feet. Jesus didn't dominate or lord over anybody. He loved. And he led by example. Right? So, the Nicolaitans don't do that. They rule, man. They rule. That's not how we minister to people. In fact, somebody says, I minister so and so. And they think that somehow by being a minister, they're above you. But what does the word minister really mean? 
It means servant. It means I like to tell them that sometimes. If you're a minister, shouldn't you be serving these people instead of yelling at them, dominating them? Tell them what to do, where to go, and what time to do it? God eventually will expose people like that. How many of you guys have heard of a church called La Luz del Mundo? You have, Lee? How do you know? How did, where did you hear about it? My dad. He was part of that? Or he told you about it? He told me about it. So there was one right here on Highland. Did you know that? La Luz del Mundo. They have a big, big, fancy church in East L.A. It says La Luz del Mundo. It has a big eyeball on the top. Why? And the founder of the church, not the founder, but the grandson who is the leader of the church, his name is Joaquin something. He, would, he was a Nicolaitan. He would lord over the people. Until eventually, he started having sex with the women in the church. He started uh, being involved in pornography. He started having sex with some of the children. And last week, the FBI busted him. And they have him right now in federal custody. His bail is $25 million. Google it. Wow. Wow. He claims to have 1 million followers. Most of them are in Mexico. Oh, and they got him for uh, when you bring people, sex trafficking. Yeah, wow. Google that. He was a Nicolaitan. He was lording over the people. Come here, young lady. Come into my office. You love God? Yeah, take your clothes off. And bring your kid, too. That's what he was doing, man. He was a Nicolaitan. Jesus hates those deeds. Jesus would rather be compassionate, wash the feet of the people, lead by example. Not that Jesus wouldn't discipline. He, he, he scolded Peter. He scolded John and his brother. But at the same time, he was a minister. He wouldn't lord over the people. Were right? they in the Old Testament too? Hmm? Were they in the Old Testament too? Who? The Nico- Nico- that, that philosophy has always been. And it's always tied into a cult. So when you see it, if someone says there, we're the church, ah, no, you're not. You might be a false church, but you're not the real church. Right? So whenever you see somebody wearing Nikes, that's what that's all at. Nike to conquer. Of course, not in that way, but you know, in sports or whatever, right? Um so Jesus wants to be the Lord of your life. He doesn't want a man to be the Lord of your life. That's one of the things I always appreciated about Pastor Rawl and Pastor Chuck and Pastor Dale. If you went to them and you said, Pastor Rawl, Pastor Dale, I think that the Lord wants me to do this or that. They would say, pray about it. And whatever the Lord tells you to do, do it. No, but Rawl, what do you think? I'm not God, Mario. I think you should pray. And I'll be praying for you too. That's the way it should be. Right? I can't tell you the direction for your life. Nobody can do that. We hope that you would be in the Word. Because it'll be your compass, right? But that's as far as uh, that goes. Um, so the church in Ephesus was doing some church, some some things very good. They got an A plus in some categories, some departments. But then verse four. Nevertheless, he says, "I have this against you: you have left keyword left your first love." Remember, therefore, where you have fallen, repent and do the first works first, or else. I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Listen, good thing it says you left your first love. So if it say, oh, they lost their first love. That's not what it says. If they lost it, they wouldn't be able to return to it. They left their first love. So Jesus says you can repent. Does anybody know what it means to repent? It means to do a U-turn. It means to do a U-turn and walk the other way. I was sinning over here. I was moving in that direction. Now I'm moving in this direction. He says, do that. And everything will be cool. Right? You know what happened? They didn't do it. They never returned to their first love. How do you know? Well, if you get a book with pictures, or if you go to the area of Turkey, where the church of Ephesus used to be, there's no more church. Jesus removed the candlestick. They didn't repent. Right? So what is this whole thing about uh, this, this indictment? You have left your first love. Here's what it is. They were so busy serving the king that they didn't have time for the king. 
When they woke up in the morning, it was work, 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 work. Start cooking the food, man. The hungry people are going to show up. We got to feed them. Let's get the homeless. The widows come at 1 o'clock. The orphans come at 3. We're going to take care of them. Got a potluck on Sunday. Got to paint the church. And Jesus says, no, 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 man. All of that is secondary. You and I need to spend time together. You used to do that, but you stopped doing that. You used to be very passionate about me, but you're not anymore. You used to be in the Bible all the time, but you haven't picked it up in years. It's got dust on the cover. I want you to spend time with me. All that other stuff is secondary, is what Jesus is telling uh, this church, right? And so Jesus finally removed its, uh, its, its lampstand. Uh, he's not there anymore. And the church ceases to exist. Some of the other churches are still uh, active in the world. But this one ceases to, uh, to exist because they never turned around. And in a church or in the lives of individuals, if you stop having your devotional time with the Lord, you'll find that you begin to see and you begin to feel like He's not present with you anymore. He's there, but you don't feel it. The fire is gone. It's been watered down. He needs devotional time with us. Nowadays, I wake up between 5 and 5.30, something like that. And I go outside. And you know what I, I notice? is right about that time, somewhere in that half hour, the birds start singing. And then I'm in prayer. And then I'm reading my Bible. And man, the day is beautiful. It takes a lot to ruin my day after that. It can happen. But it takes a lot. But that's where you want to be with the Lord. We're almost done. He says to the churches. Uh, this is the message to the churches. And then he says. To him who overcomes. I'm sorry. He says. He who has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Again. If you have an ear. This letter is to you. Individually as well as the church. And this is what he says. To him who overcomes. So the fire is out. The passion is gone. You haven't spent a morning with the Lord in five years. He says overcome. Overcome what? Whatever it is that is standing in your way. On those mornings. If you wake up in the morning and you got to smoke weed. Overcome it. Get rid of it. If you call up your girlfriend first thing in the morning. Put her off until 12, man. Spend time with the Lord. You know, whatever it is. If you jog, if you lift weights, that's good. But spend time with the Lord first. Because here's what happens. Once the morning gets going, you get phone calls, you got problems, you're working, call Social Security, whatever. And then you say, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to spend time with the Lord. Then it's 5 o'clock in the evening, you ain't spend time with the Lord. And you know what happens? You have three enemies. The world, Satan, and your flesh. The next day your flesh comes at you again. And you skip another day. Pretty soon it's weeks, then it's months, then it's years. And you haven't spent time with the Lord. He will remove His candlestick. You will feel that uh, an absence of His presence. So He says, overcome those things. Man, just put it to the side. And set your alarm and wake up early, right? A cup of coffee helps too. <laughs> yeah, he says, I will give to those people who overcome to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So Jesus simply wants to be not number two, number one in your life. And that's really what the first letter to the church is all about. Make him number one. He would say, remember Mario, when you first got saved, you couldn't put the Bible down. If you went to a on a drive in your car, you had Christian radio on. If you were at home, you were read, 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 read. And you never read a book till you were 37 years old, but you had all kinds of books about the Bible that you were reading all the time. You know, if you were ever there and now you're not, it is so simple. You say, what do I do? What do I do? It's so simple. Tell Jesus. Repent. Tell Him, I have fallen out of love with you. Help me to get back to where I was. I've had to do that over a period of time, a few times in the past. 
Let me tell you, he comes on like a wildfire because he wants that for you. You'll see. You're going to start meeting people like, wow, I just met this guy at the payphone. Man, he's telling me about the Bible. Somebody sent me a book. It's not the Bible, but it's a book about the Bible, and I'm all turned on again. He'll rekindle that fire because that's what he wants. He's desperate for your love. You know, the Bible teaches us that God created everything in the world. How? With his breath. With his breath, he spoke it and it came to being. But what did God have to do to save us from our sins? Send his only begotten son down to earth. die. To die. What is more precious to God? All creation or your soul? Your soul. He wants to spend time with us. He loves us that much. So man, get on board. And if you happen to be on Olive Street, get with Greg in the morning. Say, Greg, what are you reading? Explain it to me. And he will. If you're on Greenwood, I don't think anybody's here from Greenwood. But if you're on Greenwood, start a conversation with Bobby. He knows a lot about the Bible. Or wherever you're at. And if you say, well, I'm at a house nobody really knows about the Bible. Then you are going to have to be the teacher. Pick one up, start reading it, and talk with somebody else in the house about it. Because that is going to be the freedom that you've been looking for. You know that empty spot that you have inside you, that empty hole? It's going to get filled when you start doing this. And here's the deal. Do you know that God made us in His image? If God made us in His image and we don't fill ourselves up with Him, we're going to fill ourselves up with something. If you're thirsty enough and you want water, you're going to drink a Coke if I bring it to you. It's going to just make you more thirsty. If I bring you salt water, you'll drink it. No. You will. If you're thirsty enough, I guarantee you yeah, will. But then you go crazy. You will. But you'll drink it. You really will go crazy. You can't drink and guess water. what? When you try to fill up this void with something other than Jesus, you will go crazy. So, you're going to fill it up with something. Fill it up with God. Sex won't do it. Drugs won't do it. Rock and roll. Hobbies won't do it. Rock and roll won't do it. It'll leave you feeling empty. There's a lot of people that died today around the world that died empty. Chasing some kind of crazy dream. We don't have to be that. He wants to give us life. And if we spend time with Him, we're going to taste it. We're going to eat it. We're going to swallow it. And man, it's going to take you to the next level. With that said, Greg, why don't you go ahead.